You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hello there, friends and readers. Welcome to Olivia's Book Club, and I am your host, Olivia Fierro. Very excited to talk to you today. There are so many great books coming out this spring that we know our TBR stacks are going to be growing like weeds in the spring, right? Uh, But there is a novel that you will absolutely have to add to that growing list and maybe put it all the way to the top. All That Is Mine, I Carry With Me. Just saying the title, it kind of gives me the chills. It is such a beautiful title, and it captures uh, the literary quality of this phenomenal book. So this is the new uh, novel by William Landay, the author of Mission Flats, The Strangler, and Defending Jacob. Defending Jacob, of course, recently made into a series for Apple TV+, and his law expertise comes from a background as an assistant district attorney and also, oh yeah, a Yale Law degree. So let me bring in the author today to talk about uh, his return to the bookstore, All That Is Mine, I Carry With Me. Uh, Bill begins in 1975 with the disappearance of Jane Larkin, who is a suburban mom of three kids, the wife to a prominent criminal defense attorney, and whoosh, she's gone. And our primary narrations coming from one of her two sons. And it's... Uh, it's, a, it's just a remarkable book. And when your name popped up in my net galley, I thought, wait, could it be? So uh, it's been a minute. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I know that readers are going to be very excited to, to, to see your name and, and your new book out in, in the world, in their bookstores, in their library queues, uh, because I was looking at the years and I thought, wait a second, this can't be. Yes, it can be. The first book, which I also read, Mission Flats, 2003. 2007, I'm adding The Strangler to my to my list. I missed that one. 2012, Defending Jacob. So you really were taking your time, yes? <laughs> uh, that's one way to look at it. Uh, <laughs> that makes it sound a lot more pleasant than it actually was. Uh, th- this book was a struggle to write, and um, I'm not sure in hindsight exactly why that was. I think it's a complex book, and it was ambitious i i didn't want to follow up defending jacob with defending jacob 2 uh which would have been the temptation mm-hmm. which honestly my editor probably i'm would sure have been. <laughs> it would have been easy to market but i kind of feel like i want to be the sort of writer that that readers just trust and that you never quite know what the next book is going to be but i think when you go from book to book and 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 you earn readers trust they'll follow you to different places and as a reader that's what i'm looking for that's what i love it's the book that surprises you and that uh takes you in to unexpected places and and so that's what i'm trying to create and and that takes time unfortunately and there's a lot of struggle involved <laughs> Uh, I don't, it's funny. I don't, this is my fourth book now and I don't find that it gets any easier going from book to book. I never feel like, oh, I'm an expert now. I've got this thing licked. I can just bang out these books. It's, it's always hard. Isn't that interesting? Because I have such a, a great, uh, pleasure. I get so, so much pleasure out of being able to talk to authors. I, I love to read and I, I admire so much the craft of being able to create this other world that sucks me in and, and, and takes me away. And, you know, that you start thinking about these people as they're real and, you know, trying to outsmart the the plot and, and just everything that happens emotionally with, with a great book. And many of the authors I speak to, I mean, they're churning out books uh, they're on a, a a once a year, you know, wait a second, let me think we're talking about this one, but I've already turned in the next one. And so let me not <laughs> let, let me let me get my mindset straight. And so it's just it it's it's incredible the the pacing that people are able. I talked to, to John Grisham and he's like, well, it's really very easy. It takes just one year to write a book. You start this on <laughs> and he, he had a system and you start the start. You outline this and this on actually January 1 or January 2nd was when he does it. And then by six months in, you're turning in this and then that. That, that 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 that's how it works, and so a very matter of fact, and and, and I, it's incredible that somebody can put out good work doing that, um, but that you can that you can be on this journey. Uh, did this mean that there were many different books that got tossed to the side, or was a kernel of this book that I just read 
a part of of what was marinating or or, or you were struggling with for the last many years? Uh, I would say there was one book that got tossed aside. Uh, but for the most part, it was me trying to make this idea work. And there are uh, things about this book that make it a challenge to write. Uh, one of them is that it's 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 about a missing person. It's not clearly a murder. You know, there's not, not it doesn't follow the usual format of a, a body found at the beginning and a detective is brought in and you go through an array of clues and finally... Uh, 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 the, 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 the suspect is revealed. Um, this is a different sort of book and it meant to uh, capture the way these things go in real life. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that always felt artificial to me about crime stories is that level of certainty that you reach. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's always that scene at the end of the book uh, in which the suspects are gathered classically and the detective uh, solves the crime and points at the correct uh, 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 suspect. In real life, there are wrongful convictions. There is even after a jury verdict, there's always doubt. You never reach uh, a, a degree of certainty where you are utterly convinced, even with a confession, even with what seems like smoking gun sort of evidence, uh, there are mistakes that are made and the error rate is much higher than we like to think. And the doubt that remains after a guilty verdict is real. It's it's human beings in a jury box. It's human beings who are judges and lawyers and mistakes are made. And so I wanted to capture some of that uncertainty, which is a difficult thing to capture in this genre of book where working toward a solution is is the whole heart of the, uh, uh, of the of this kind of story. Well, in, so te in television, in ways, things yeah, are wrapped up in one hour. <laughs> right? right, exactly, exactly. And this is, it's satisfying, you know, as I watch those shows too, and it's, it's entertaining uh, to reach that sort of conclusion. But I think if we, you know, if you read the news, uh, it's very easy to see now how often wrongful convictions happen. And that, uh, you know, having been a DA, one thing you see is that, that's built in at the investigation process too. You know, there's always doubt. Uh, there's always an array of possibilities and you wind up choosing one suspect and that's who you prosecute. And once you've locked on to somebody, you follow it through. There's no choice. Uh, but at each stage, you are making decisions. You are excluding possibilities and any of those decisions could be wrong. No matter how smart and careful and well-intentioned you are, mistakes will be made. Well, I've been mean, here in the news business, of course, you know, we'll mention cold case investigations being resumed. And, you know, it, it, it's a blip. It's a story. It's it's uh, an agency maybe, you know, uh, reviving interest in, in a case that has gone unsolved. But we forget about the, the humans who are kind of left in this sort of raw, open, uh, you know, un, uh, uh, no healing wounds um, state waiting right. and that that just that that um you know suspended in in real in a reality that that you're not allowed to to move on or even have any sense of understanding and i don't believe that there's ever probably moving on from from a, a traumatic loss like this but um just just to never even have answers and to to grow up in a world where you're you're defined by that level of uncertainty and that level of right. doubt about everything that you know and everyone you know. And so right. I think that that's so well captured in the dynamics of this family and in particular uh, the one brother and sister who are – their their lives are all kind of shaped by, by this – big question mark, not only the absence of their mother, but also just this looming question of what happened and, and who can we trust and, and what, what can we believe. Right. And the book is about that toll of, of doubt and uncertainty. And that seems like a very dark kind of story to tell. And I, uh, I would uh, like readers to uh, view it in the, in the more universal way. I think uh, we all, uh, as part of growing up, learn to let go. Uh, we lose our parents one way or another, even if it's just by moving out. And we come to know our parents as adults. Uh, as peers, and we see them uh, as human beings uh, with all the flaws that we have. 
And, and so that sort of process of coming to know your parents and coming to leave your parents uh, or to lose them uh, is something that we can all relate to. Uh, and so it feels like a very dark story, uh, but I feel like these, uh, that brother and sister and, and all of these siblings, uh, they're a family. Mm -hmm. And they go through this as a family with the, all the kinds of tensions that we all know, because uh, we all uh, have, have gone through that experience one way or another. And so to me, it's a it's a sort of a universal story that is uh, uh, being told through the prism of a of a very dark and unusual one. Mm -hmm. And um, and just testing testing what our loyalties mean when when it comes to family and, and what we can tolerate in others when we sometimes don't understand what their motivations are or, or why they are um, or behave in a way that's so different from maybe how we would we would want them to or how we think we do. Um, will you for for our listeners here? Uh, outline a little bit about the characters that are at play here in this uh, beautiful novel and also refer, uh, refer how you can uh, to the title of the book because it's really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Titles are very difficult. So <laughs> it's uh, that's a that's a hard one. In fact, that title came very late uh, in the writing process. Um, so the story opens with a young girl, uh, eight years old, uh, who comes home from school one day to find her house empty. Uh, her name is Miranda Larkin, and we, uh, she is a friend of, uh, of the writer, uh, a writer-narrator, a novelist who bears a striking resemblance to me uh, and who has gone a long time since his last book and is struggling with that. <laughs> uh, and we, so we follow uh, little Miranda and her, uh, she has two older brothers, uh, Jeff, who is kind of a wise guy, middle child, and Alex, who is a uh, more conservative oldest, firstborn. Their dad uh, is a prominent uh, criminal defense lawyer named Dan Larkin. And he, uh, <clears throat> he immediately is suspected in this case, uh, especially because he is so expert uh, in crimes that it is presumed that he would be sly enough to outfox the police. Uh, if there's anybody who could get away with a murder, it is presumed that it will be this guy. So we follow this case as it initially does go uh, unsolved for decades, uh, even as the suspicion kind of shrouds this family. And it's told though through, uh, through the relationships and th from the different perspectives of the people involved and so as much as the story is about that case, it's also about this these kids growing up, and it's about the structure of how the story is told, which is, uh, I hope, uh, inventive and interesting uh, in its own right. And it's a book that leaves a lot, uh, a lot of uh, room for the reader to participate. Uh, it trusts the reader to uh, do a lot of the puzzle solving herself, uh, to make inferences. A lot of things are not spelled out in this book uh, that would be uh, more explicit in a conventional mystery. Mm -hmm. And that's because I feel like uh, the most engaging reads ask the reader to participate and trust the reader to solve a few mysteries herself. And that engagement, that active involvement of the reader in in performing the story for herself, as all readers do, as they pick the words up off the page and read, but also in helping to solve the mystery herself, uh, makes for a more vivid uh, reading experience. And that's, you know, we've all had those kind of electric reading experiences where the book comes alive for us. And, and as a writer, that's what you're looking to create. You know, you want your reader to, uh, to be swept up and to be actively engaged in the story. And so it's structured uh, to create that sort of involvement as well. You certainly succeeded with me, uh, no, <laughs> no doubt. Um, let's. I, I, I'm, I'm curious about. So that your your last novel, of course, is defending Jacob. Gigantic hit. I remember 
when this book came into my life very specifically because to me, uh, I have a lot of relationships that are sort of uh, validated or solidified by a good book recommendation. <laughs> so uh, much like, you know, uh, I think it was uh, Donna Tartt's Secret History that I said, well, f because of that, I was able to marry my husband because I could assess his intellectual abilities and, you know, whether he had any depth, you know, that, that we could bond over this book. And so, you had know, he, that- Had he read it or you gave it to him to read? I gave it to him like to test. read as a test. Well, well, when we met, <laughs> when we uh -huh. met, it's important to note we met, and he was a police sergeant at the time. And uh, you know, you, you meet certain people, and you have certain ideas or about what somebody is like, and you know, maybe you read a lot of books. And much like my father had read, I guess, a lot of detective type of books. And when he wanted to marry me, he said, you know, well, are you going to shake my daughter? Are you an alcoholic who has a lot of affairs? Uh -huh. and he's like, what kind of books are you reading? You know. So um, I, I also wanted to make sure that he was somebody who enjoyed books the way I did it. So it was, you know, a, a little test there. <laughs> it was very important. And then I remember a, a girlfriend of mine who's a longtime college sorority sister friend. Her husband is a criminal defense attorney. And she said, I have a book for you and you both are going to love it. And we both just burned through this book and we're obsessed with it. And I can't stop thinking about it. And it was defending Jacob. And so uh, we were reading it kind of simultaneously, passing it back and forth in like a, a fit of we had to know what was going to happen next. And so it was a, just a very definitive reading experience that um, it was very unique for me. And, and so was was that reception that you got, because I know that I'm not alone in, in that, um, it does that become burdensome, I guess, in, in the creative process or is it exhilarating and then and then become stressful or how does how does that, you know, how do, how do how do you receive um, the good news that you really made the magic happen? It's really interesting. It doesn't touch the creative process at all when I'm in the writing process. I'm really not thinking about the audience at all and I'm not thinking about uh whether the book will succeed or fail um you are trying to live inside the moment inside the scene inside the story and everything else sort of falls away um as for the reception for that book in a funny way too that doesn't really hit home either i'm very happy uh that the book succeeded obviously um but I almost feel like the books have their own life. Mm -hmm. um, it's a weird thing how this medium works. Uh, books are written in isolation by me, and then they're consumed in isolation as well by whoever's reading them. Even if you're in the on a crowded bus uh, reading reading the book, uh, you are in your own private world as you do it. So in a strange way. I feel like the books go out into the world and they have these <laughs> adventures and and I'm not really involved. Um, it's it's a strange medium that way. Um, I'm happy for it. And we live in a time where it's very easy to reach out to a writer uh, and, and have an interaction personally. And so I hear all the time, even now, uh, about that book. So um, so in that way, I suppose I, I hear it, but it doesn't get into my head as far as the creative process goes. So you must have felt quite removed from it, or was it with like watching somebody else's story play out a little bit when the adaptation happened so recently? You know, that was actually surreal because you would go, it was filmed around here, uh, and Chris Evans is from Boston as well. And and so he was actually living at home when he did it. I, I, he actually has a place here still. Um but you would, I would go to the set, and first of all, this, the, the set is enormous. There's 200 people working on it and big trucks and all this stuff. And they have meticulously recreated this world that you dreamed up, and actors are speaking the lines that you just made up. And it's very odd to see it come to life because the nature of a novel is that it never quite does. I mean... It, it happens in the reader's imagination. It's almost not intended to be uh, made so concrete and so vivid like that. Um, the other thing is a book is different for every reader. Every reader will imagine the characters a little differently. I personally, when I'm reading, I never quite get a, 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 a clear picture of what a character might look like uh, or sound like or how they might walk. Um, 
so to see your characters embodied by these actors suddenly makes them very specific uh, in a way that may diverge from what you intended. And Chris Evans is, is a lot younger than the character in the book. Uh, and that, I don't know if that impacts the way the story is received by an audience. Um, but so be it. It's the, the, I always looked at the adaptation as a, a new work in a new medium. I never saw it as a continuation of the book in any way. So I always felt like any changes they made were were welcome and, and any creative decisions were were welcome. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's interesting, but it's complicated. Yeah, I, I'm sure it must be. Um, here, of course, we were trying to be uh have to be very careful and no no spoilers ever with our new books we're talking about but i know since defending jacob has been out for so long and and we've seen the show in this let's just a little bit if you would kind of dig into the theme of what it is that just struck such a nerve with people i mean that that push and pull as a parent um as a person of what we're willing to uh, overlook or cover up or protect for somebody we love. I think it's it, it's just a very relatable um, kind of you know intense question, like an ethical question that's that could torment you, and you could you could have you know five zillion different perspectives on it based on the the moment of of every day or every situation. Yeah, I think it's, well, thematically, it's very consistent with the new book. The, mm -hmm. the new book is about children uh, regarding their parents and uh, beginning to come to grips with the flaws that their parents may have and the, the sins that they may have committed uh, and, and accepting or not accepting those things. Uh, Defending Jacob was the mirror image. It was about the anxiety that parents feel uh, as they look at their children, and we all are struggling to understand one another. Uh, we can never quite know another person. Uh, and yet as a parent, especially, you identify with your kids and you feel that uh, your kids are representing you uh, in a way to the world. And you know the pride that we feel as parents when our, uh, when our kids do something good in the world uh, is natural and, and seems uncomplicated to us. Uh, but there are things that our kids do that, that aren't so great uh, and that we worry about and that we can't really control. Um, so it's about that complexity and I think that anxiety about uh, about raising kids and, and what they might turn into and how little control you may have over that um, is, is, is universal, is universal. And it's a big chance that you take when you have a kid because you just don't know what you're going to get. And they may bring all kinds of complications into your life. And we tend to think that with enough uh, enthusiastic, uh, highly involved parenting that we can control a lot of those variables. But uh, but we really can't. You can be a, a, the, a helicopter parent hovering very low and being very involved in your kid's life. And yet they're still a, they're their own person. And they're going to do what they're going to do to some extent. And, and we parents are implicated in that. If I just cut down on processed sugars and keep them very busy in activities, <laughs> I know they won't be any sort of sociopath, right? <laughs> There's a contract that guarantees that, correct? Somewhere? Yeah, you're telling yourself that. <laughs> right. Well, this is the thing. You, you, bad, bad people come from good families all the time. And more complicated than that, uh, complicated people who do good and bad things uh come from ordinary families all the time and you know these people don't uh they don't come from casting directors they live next door to you <laughs> so you just have to take the risk i guess seriously well and i think as i was reflecting back on on that story in particular as i had finished up this this new one i was thinking I, I feel it almost had has sparked sort of a genre of writing, and, and I think you're probably going to be too humble to to, to say yes. But I, I'm thinking about a lot of books. I like a whole like subset genre, which is kind of tormented wife and mom, you know, who could snap at any moment. Um, th those are a lot of the books that I gravitate That's towards. <laughs> <laughs> That's my genre. Um, it's it's you know I don't know I just I just relate to it. But there's a there are quite a few great books and really enjoyable books that sort of teeter with 
uh, especially from a mother perspective, uh, looking at your par- your child, you know, maybe with with uh, uh, fear or with you know seeing something dark in them or feeling that they can't love them for some reason. And I was even just thinking of Ashley Audrain's The Push, which was one of my favorite books of the last couple of years, um, because it just it just goes there with the complexity of uh, maybe somebody feeling like there's something wrong with you and. I don't know that I really want to be a part of it. And it kind of opens opens a door to be a little more honest about uh, how how there can be darkness in, in us or in somebody else. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's, you know, early on in my career, I think I was sort of uh, pigeonholed as a crime writer. And I never thought of myself that way. I always thought that I'd been writing uh, family dramas that happened to involve crime. And, and to me, that's what makes these uh, sorts of books interesting. As a DA, I think, you know, you see these these cases come across your desk and you sort of realize that real crimes aren't that interesting. They tend to be repetitive. Uh, criminals aren't that interesting. They tend to be not that clever. Uh, and so the sort of crimes that you see on TV feel artificial uh, and, and a more authentic sort of crime story just isn't all that interesting to me. Uh, so for me, I, I think of crime as a, a prism to sort of look at all of these uh, relationship issues and family issues, and that's what makes them interesting. A lot of the uh, anxieties that remain latent and, and unstated in our lives uh, can be acted out uh, through crime. They can be dramatized in ways that that make them easier to discuss than maybe uh, if, than maybe they would be if we were addressing them directly. So to me, that's the real appeal of of crime dramas is they say something about us, uh, <laughs> us non criminals. Mm-hmm. Uh, they speak to us for a reason. Some stories resonate with us for a reason, um, and those are the stories that stick. Those are the ones that penetrate, and that's why defending Jacob. Uh, landed the way it did uh, because everybody could look at that story and even if you had the most angelic children in the world you knew that anxiety oh yeah and, and i think yeah and my hope is that the new book will, will feel that way as well i mean that with every book you're looking to uh capture some of those uh, uh experiences that we all know yeah and i think that's that really is what we come to crime novels for i don't think that the uh uh, the suspense or the the violence or whatever it is, the intrigue uh, lasts. I think it's interesting. It'll keep us turning the pages. I don't think it'll make us remember the book uh, six months or six years later. Mm-hmm. Kind of a the good ones like this. It's a it's a kind of a temperature check on your own morality. I mean, what can you? What can you what can you withstand and still love somebody or what would you be willing to compromise because you love somebody um, in all of the ways to look at it? As we wrap up, Bill, would you be so kind as to give a little writer's advice? I imagine that because you are you are uh, open about the, the the time and the turbulence that can come that, that that can be poured into or can be required for the art. Um, what advice do you give for for writers who are are beginning or are, you know, grappling with the idea of, of sitting down and telling a story and they love to read and they, they don't know if they can, they can put a story together that somebody else is going to connect with the way that they've connected with the books they love. I always hesitate to answer this question only because my writing process is so (laughs) so obviously unreliable. Who am I to be giving advice? Um, I find that I'm constantly switching up. I'm constantly getting stuck and battling my way out of it. And so the advice that I would give is not to be psyched out by those book a year writers who, who are like metronomes and they, they hit a word count every day and they just keep grinding like machines. It isn't always like that. That's not the only way to write. And for a lot of people, uh, writing is a grind. And the idea of um, pushing your way through these obstacles uh, is equally valid. Uh, And there are going to be a lot of creative people whose process is not so businesslike and programmatic uh, as 
as a, as a book a year uh, sort of author might be. And, and I do feel like that can yield a more interesting book. I mean, the way to write a book a year and to be one of these regular producers is to systematize your production. Uh, and that necessarily involves uh, formula. And I think formula is poison for uh, for me, at least as a reader. I know a lot of readers uh, want predictability. They want to know what's coming. Uh, for me, those sort of those are the books that never quite come off the page for me. Uh, I feel that I need to encounter something new and stimulating, and that requires a writer who who digs deeper. And and so I guess what I would say is, you know, head into the wind. Um, don't be afraid of these obstacles because if you want to uh, accomplish something great, if you really want to work at the extreme outer limit of your talent, which is what you should be trying to do, uh, then you're going to encounter some of these difficulties. And I don't suggest that you take 10 years to write a book, <laughs> but if it happens, if that's the price of, of a great book, then then pay it. Because when you're on your deathbed at the end, Nobody's going to look at, at the book you wrote on the shelf and say, oh, that's a great book, but it took him a long time to write it. <laughs> They're much more likely to say, oh, that's a lousy book. And it doesn't really matter that he was able to bang it out in six months. <laughs> that is so that's, excellent advice. I don't know advice. qualifies advice, does it? <laughs> it well, it's excellent perspective because it's it's really an alternate voice than we hear uh, from a lot. And, you know, it's it, it kind of aligns with, I mean, many things that are worthwhile or on that other side of hard or whatever is the, you know, much more canned saying, but it, it but it, it can be worth the effort. And, and, and clearly it is because uh, it's yet another amazing book. So uh, thank you so much. All that is mine. I carry with me as you are listening to this. Uh, Friends is out now from William Landate. Bill, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. That was very enjoyable. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.